Former Assistant Secretary of State Alan Keyes spent 11 years with the U.S. State Department. He served in the U.S. Foreign Service and on the staff of the National Security Council before becoming Ronald Reagan's Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations. In the interim, he served as ambassador to the U.N. Economic and Social Council, where he represented America's sovereign interests in the United Nations General Assembly. Dr. Keyes was president of Citizens Against Government Way and founder of National Taxpayers Action Day. He is a two-time Republican nominee for U.S. Senate in Maryland, and in the 1996 and 2000 Republican presidential campaigns, Allen eloquently elevated the national political debate as a candidate for president. His unequivocal pro-family message, he forced the GOP leadership to address America's moral crisis. His political views are based on America's founding ideals, those contained in the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. Dr. Keyes has a Ph.D. in government from Harvard and wrote his dissertation on constitutional theory. Allen hosted his own syndicated radio show throughout the 1990s, America's Wake Up Call, and a television commentary show, Alan Keyes is Making Sense, during 2002 on MSNBC. Allen and his wife, Jocelyn, have three children, Francis, Maya, and Andrew. His stated purpose in life, like the Founding Fathers, is to provide a secure future for our posterity. Dr. Alan Keyes, it is my sincere privilege to welcome you to Global Freedom Report. How are you, Alan? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? Oh, I'm doing just fine. I want to tell you, you are one of a very short list of people I would invite to be a guest host for this show, and that's because you are so obviously passionate about truth and liberty. However, you, for several years, were embarrassed to the United Nations. I've never, I've never understood this. And so this is a great chance for me to get an answer to a question that has, has uh, um, been there for years. You were ambassador to the UN, which does not subscribe to the principles of individual freedom. In your own conscience, how do you reconcile being part of the UN with your dedication to liberty? I wasn't part of the UN. A lot of people don't understand when you are an ambassador to the United Nations, I'm an ambassador to the Economic Social Council, you are a part of, I was part of the Reagan administration, and I went to the UN because the president asked me to go. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, and he's the commander-in-chief, and you know where he tells you to go. Uh, or And I went because, like any other uh, place where we were under fire at the time, uh, it was a place where uh, Reagan people were doing battle. Uh, in order to make sure that uh, America wasn't damaged by those who were trying to destroy us. Uh, so the way uh, asking why I went to the United Nations is like, I don't know, I think Patton, why you went to Germany. <laughs> okay. All right. It wasn't to visit Berlin. <laughs> All right. that, no, that's fair. That's fair. So during your time with the U.N., did you encounter attacks on U.S. sovereignty, such as the Law of the Sea Treaty that we're going to talk about or the Small Arms Treaty? Did you encounter those types of attacks, and how did you address them when they arose? Well, of course. I mean, part of what I was about and part of what I was explicitly asked by our then U.S. firm rep, uh, Gene Kirkpatrick, to do uh, was uh, to uh, deal with areas, whether it was Middle Eastern policy, arms control, uh, and disarmament things that would occur at conferences uh, in the context of what were supposed to be uh, discussions of the economic and social affairs of, of the world. And, and these were always turned into battlefields where people would be trying to get resolutions passed, the other things done that were completely contrary to our uh, interests, to our values, to our principles, uh, and to our way of life. So what we did with all that stuff was we fought it. Uh, and for the most part, fought it off successfully. Uh, I mean, one of uh, Reagan's claims to fame, I think, in this area is that he was dead set against the law of the sea treaty. Uh, and uh, it uh, came to nothing during the course of... Uh, of his tenure, we certainly didn't join uh, in with it. And unlike some subsequent a administrations, uh, we fought it on the grounds that people are still fighting it today as a violation of our sovereignty, as damaging uh, to the uh, economic interests of the country uh, in terms of our free enterprise approach uh, to economic affairs, and especially as a deep surrender of the sovereignty of the American people to an idea of global governance that is actually completely contrary 
uh, to our idea of what government is based on. Uh, so I think in these areas and in areas that had to do with the defense of life, with the protection uh, of our Second Amendment rights and things of this kind, uh, we took the position that we were there to make sure that nothing about uh, America's participation in the United Nations was allowed to destroy our constitutional uh, form of government uh, and the rights and sovereignty we as a people are supposed to enjoy. Reports indicate the Law of the Sea Treaty is dead on arrival. Um, that's because 34 senators have signed on opposing it. However, John Kerry has stated categorically that he will not call for a vote until after the November elections. Do you believe the election results will change the Senate sufficiently to give enough support to lost, lost folks' Law of the Sea Treaty? That is one of the questions that, that I think has a bearing on the reality that we are faced with in 2012. Friend. And that reality has very much to do with the fact that though we're supposed to be facing this alternative between the bad old nasty Obama Democrats, right? All committed to socialism and the surrender of sovereignty and the destruction of America, all which is true. And uh, arrayed against them, we're supposed to have the wonderful Republicans who are going to stand for free enterprise and constitutionalism and American security and all this. You and I both know that's not true. Uh, you and I both know that, for instance, Mitt Romney represents in his very person exactly what is ordinarily described as uh, a Republican in name only. I call them crypto-socialists. At every stage of his career, in every important area of policy, uh, he was one of these folks. A and until uh, just very recently, there was hardly a conservative in America worth the name who wouldn't have told you that about Mitt Romney. Uh, well, uh, even National Review and people like this had him in the list of the top ten rhinos uh, in America, right? Uh, and what has changed? Nothing, except that now he's moving his mouth to lie to a national audience about his views, the way he lied to the audience in Massachusetts in order to get elected, pretending he was pro-life and all this stuff, and then acting in a totally contrary way. So what am I to expect is going to happen in a vital area like this? When we already have, don't we, the, the precedent uh, that the, what I call the Bush-Romney-Rockefeller wing of the Republican Party. Has, has pretty much always uh, been anxious to get stuff like the Law of the Sea Treaty through. They think it through from the point of view of how it's going to impact their crony capitalist international corporate buddies, right? And they think, well, this is going to be good the way uh, exporting jobs overseas is good and free trade was good and so forth. And so on. Not good for America, not good for us. Not good for the American people, not good for our prosperity, not good for our sovereignty, not good for our maintenance of constitutional government but good so that they can line their pockets any way they have to, even if it's at the expense of all those things. Uh, well, do you believe that th this is just somehow going to change uh, because Obama's defeated and Romney's put in? Come on, give me a break. My bet is that it would make it even easier, that with a little tinkering here and there and some verbiage, you'll try to pretend that something has changed, and then folks will get it through because they'll twist the arms of people in the sense that you can't oppose the president. What if that happens? Yeah. And it's not Obama anymore. It's Romney we're talking about. Don't you think it's more likely to get through? Hey, uh, you know, you're talking, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. Alan, I need to take a pause for a moment. We have a better connection. Uh, Alan Keyes is my guest, and if you would like to join in, 888-747- 1968. Yes, I understand that helped clear it up, so that's excellent. Um, Alan, the United Nations Small Arms Treaty would effectively change the restrictions on government provided by the Second Amendment. Yet only a constitutional convention, or at the very least a constitutional amendment, could change the Constitution. Do you think the U.S. will ratify the Small Arms Treaty, and if so, how would that affect the individual rights to bear firearms in defense of life, liberty, and country? Well, certainly, I, I, I would strongly uh, hope that the United States will not ratify. Uh, this is one of those things, again, where it ought to be something that we could confidently take for granted, that there wouldn't be a Republican vote in the House for something like this, in the, I mean, in the House meaning uh, available. 
uh, so that all of those who bore the Republican label sitting in the uh, U.S. Senate would say no to a treaty of this kind. Uh, but can we be sure of that? Of course not. Not anymore. Now, you and I agree, I think, because we were talking about this not long ago, that, that you are not authorized by the words of the U.S. Constitution to pretend that by two-thirds vote in the Senate without any reference to the amendment process, you can cast away basic rights that are guaranteed in uh, the uh, Constitution as stated explicitly, of which the right to keep and bear arms is one. But unhappily, step number one, we know that on the left, all these people look for every opportunity they can to throw it away, to act as if they can shred up any portion of the Constitution. And increasingly, because of the approach they take to the Constitution, which essentially is indistinguishable in principle from the left, though sometimes they come from, to a different conclusion, you've got justices like Roberts and others who may very well subscribe to the notion that because the Constitution says that the treaties uh, along with the Constitution will be the law of the land, that means that a treaty can amend the Constitution. Uh, and, and I don't believe that's a correct argument. I believe it's an absurd and irrational argument. But have you noticed, Brent, that rationality doesn't have anything to do with the Supreme Court's judgments anymore? They don't reason carefully to a conclusion that can be justified in light of logic, in light of the principles of the Republic, in light of the intentions and meanings of the words in the Constitution. They don't do that anymore. Uh, this last couple of decisions they took, whether it was on Arizona or the one just recently uh, on uh, where they made a statement about the taxing power that has no warrant whatsoever in the Constitution, in the heritage of the country, the notion that somehow taxation is not subject to any constitutional constraint or limitation is insane without precedent and totally irrational. And yet, that's what Robert said. Uh, and, and so I, I sadly don't think we have any guarantees in the present environment uh, that uh, uh, something like this might not go through. Now, if you ask me, is it more likely to go through if Barack Obama is uh, 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 reelected? There, I would have to say, yeah, because it is still the case that this issue of Second Amendment rights seems to be one where, even though you have Romney-style rhinos who'd like to get out from under the Second Amendment, they realize that it's instant political suicide for them. I think I still believe that that's their perception. I don't know, though, because I these days I look at what's been going on. I know we're at sort of an end game in all of this. And at some point, these people will feel so arrogant about their ability uh, to rig the elections and manipulate the American people that they won't care anymore. Well, and that's, yeah, <laughs> I agree with you completely, 100%. All right, now here's something I've never heard anybody ask, so I'm going to ask it. What would it take to get out of a United Nations treaty, such as GATT, for example? Is there anything similar to a state's repeal process in which a member nation could extricate itself upon reconsideration? Oh, sure. Uh, by and large, uh, a sovereign uh, a nation can withdraw uh, from uh, a given agreement. Uh, usually there's in the agreement some terms, sometimes there are, uh, sometimes they're not, uh, which simply, you know, you give people notice and say, after such and such a time, this agreement's no longer going to bind us. Uh, now, there are certain limitations on that the, where, where the U.S. is concerned. For instance, uh, our Constitution requires us to respect any financial obligations that we've got uh, and that we have made. Now, those words are in the Constitution. We can't act as if they're not there. Uh, but, uh, but in terms of some of these political arrangements and some of these awful trade agreements and so forth and so on, of course we can well, uh, modify our participation. We are a sovereign nation. Well, would, it be, would it be a statement by the President? Would it require ratification, two-thirds ratification by the Senate? Uh, is there a procedure? Well, I, I'm not sure, because I'm trying to think whether we have, in fact, ever done it. Uh, I mean, by and large, it's something that can be done uh, by, uh, by the, if you have the agreement uh, of the branches, but I would think it would, ha would have to be done by some kind of a resolution, uh, which uh, signified the, uh, the Senate and congressional uh, acquiescence, uh, along with uh, a uh, presidential statement that then spoke for the whole uh, government. 
Uh, I don't know whether or not, and I think it might depend on prudence, whether or not you set up some kind of a mechanism that allowed you to consult with the people around the country, uh, being as how the Constitution puts treaties uh, on a level with the Constitution. Maybe you ought to take account of the opinion of the people themselves, just as you would uh, if you were backing away from a constitutional provision. Uh, but as you and I know, the treaties aren't exactly like constitutional provisions, and therefore I don't think would have to be treated necessarily in that way. Uh, but I think it would be prudent to make sure that there that it, anything that was done was, of course, done with the advice and consent uh, of the Senate, as the treaty required in the first place, uh, and probably with the support of a joint resolution of Congress or some such thing. You were President Ronald Reagan's Assistant Secretary of State. What can you tell us about Ronald Reagan the man? Huh. Well, the thing that always comes to my mind when people ask about Reagan is that of all the people I met in politics, Ronald Reagan was the man who was most seriously at peace with himself at a level and at a depth that I think is rare in people who are in politics because they spend most of their time making themselves up for others, right? Uh, and that's because a lot of them, and I think it's become the norm in our politics now, they're basically a facade that they've created in order to stitch together some coalition of power. Uh, Reagan wasn't like that. Uh, Reagan was somebody who had reached deep uh, convictions about what this country was about, about uh, the priorities in terms of our, of our liberty and our moral sensibilities that had to be respected and who stood for that through thick and thin, stood for it when he was out in the coal being beat up by people who these days would call him the great communicator and sing his praises, um, and, and, and who were trying to portray him as some kind of a madman who couldn't be trusted with nuclear weapons and so forth. I mean, I think of that and I just want to shake my head. I don't know whether to, to uh, cry or laugh when I remember that somebody like Ronald Reagan was... Uh, lambasted by George Bush Sr. and others who uh, suggested that because he was such a strong anti-communist and had wanted a strong defense and took other positions that were dead set against all their willingness to kowtow to the communists, he was too dangerous to have their nuclear weapons. And then they take this mystery man from God knows where and he's sitting in the White House now and these folks are all silent about whether or not it makes any sense to have somebody you know not who <laughs> with the control of America's national security and nuclear weapons and everything else. Everything's on its, it's been stood on its head, don't you think? I mean, it's crazy the world we're living in now. We have a question from the chat room. This comes from, he only identifies himself as seven. He says, Dr. Keyes, during your presidential campaign, you eloquently spoke many times of the Constitution, its preamble, and, and the posterity. The court has ruled the average man or woman in America were in signatories of or party to this contractual document, thereby, thereby not afforded its protection. Also, the Illinois Attorney General has claimed that the people as documented in the Constitution were actually the members of the Crown in the history of the eternal attorney general section of her website so my question is who are the true posterity of the constitution as mentioned and documented within the preamble because it doesn't appear to me that the 14th amendment citizens of the u.s are the posterity of the constitution please clear up any confusion on this subject thank you for your time and consideration dr keys alan uh, i must confess I've, I've never i'm here yeah i was listening to that i've, I've never been quite sure uh, what folks mean by uh, 14th Amendment citizens aren't posterity and so forth. The 14th Amendment simply recognized, uh, recognizes a fact. Uh, and the, uh, what the courts have made of that, uh, the, particularly when they talk about the granting of citizenship based on use solely and so forth and so on, is something uh, I think a separate issue because I think that uh, we ought to move to do something about that. Should have done it a long time ago. Uh, but in other respects, I think the whole discussion, uh, the Constitution allows for a process whereby people become citizens of the United States and can do so by law and also by means and by way of constitutional uh, statement. 
uh, you, uh, the notion that all citizens have to be natural born citizens is simply false. But once you have been naturalized, the word means made as if a natural citizen, then you have the quality of being able to transmit that to your children. Uh, and so I see no problem whatsoever, any more than there is a problem with those who were grandfathered into uh, the uh, 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 whole purview of the Constitution because they had been citizens of the colonies before the Constitution was written and so forth. Uh, so the Constitution provides for that continuity in the handing on of uh, the right of citizenship from one generation to the next. Uh, and I think that it also, by the way, when we deal with the presidency, points to a natural law basis for recognizing uh, what constitutes citizenship, and I think that obviously puts the emphasis on the biological tie. Uh, but that emphasis in that instance doesn't invalidate somehow uh, the ability of the American people to specify on what terms they will admit to the body politic, folks who have been born elsewhere, immigrated to this country, and so forth. So naturalization uh, is a recognized concept in the Constitution, uh, and uh, I don't see what difficulty is caused, whether the words that naturalize are in a law passed or in the supreme law of the land properly ratified. Let me ask you, Alan, the question I'm asking the listeners today. Do you believe Attorney General Eric Holder will be forced to resign over the fast and furious gun-running fiasco before the November elections? <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here chuckling because we keep coming back to questions, and I guess it's because it may very well be the determining issue of our present crisis. Questions that bear on one thing and one thing alone. And that is the integrity or lack thereof, the courage or lack thereof, the allegiance to the Constitution or lack thereof, of people who are elected to office in America calling themselves Republicans, right? 